What is up, everybody? Let me know in the chat if you can hear me. That light's kind of annoying. I'm going to shut that off. Much better. All right, let me know in the chat if you can hear me. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. All right. What's everybody drinking? I'm going to tweet this out so everyone can join us. Patman494 says he's drinking bleach. I would uh, suggest another option. Bleach is not good to drink. Good for getting stains out, though. We got a little Coors Light. We got a little Dr. Pepper. Chugging absinthe. A little better than bleach, but maybe don't chug it. Sip. Play it safe. I am drinking a little June Shine. Topical citrus. Big fan of the hard kombucha. Shout out June Chime. If you want to sponsor the, uh, the YouTube show. We are all for that here. All right. Let's wait for some people to trickle in here. And then we can get going with a little bit of recap. A little Voodoo Ranger. Love that. Bullet Bourbon. A good choice after uh, what you guys saw today. Brennan says he's drinking his own sadness and regret. Understandable. Jason is drinking a Corona. Gabe's drinking a Bud Light. Shout out, Gabe. Bud Light's delicious and sometimes it's called for, despite the haters. Elysian Space Dust from Michael Henderson. That's my favorite beer on the face of the earth. I was quite disappointed that I did not get to check out the Elysian tap room when I was in Seattle. My flight got delayed and I landed too late. I'm disappointed. Pacifico, love that. All right. Drinking Jameson. Okay, great. Sounds like everyone's got their drinks. Got a good amount of people in here. So let's get to it. All right. So where do you guys want me to start? We can start by talking about these penalties. I know there's a lot of uproar from you guys on Twitter. Just about a couple of the calls there. We can start with those penalties or, you know, I can just dive into a little recap of the game, go through my notes and just go through sort of what happened. And obviously we can get into the penalties that way, but you let me know what you guys want to do. All right. Start with the penalties. Brendan asked if we can start with the good things. We'll get to the good things. Don't worry. All right. Well, okay. So we're getting some mixed, mixed comments here. Let's do, let's do a recap. I think that's a lot. A lot of people are saying recap. Let's do a recap. All right. So we'll just, I'm just going to go through my notes here. Chargers win the toss. They defer. Defense is up first. And right away, I mean, it is evident that the Chargers' run defense just didn't show up to play today. Um, you know, Justin Jones is out, and they missed him dearly today with the run defense. Cowboys put up 190, 198 yards rushing on 31 attempts, a 6.4 yards per carry average. It was the worst rushing perf defense performance of any team in the league so far this season. Um and frankly, the Cowboys should have put up more than 198 yards, but there was some weird play calling there. There was a second and six where they decided to pass. They took a penalty and got behind the sticks there. And then on a later drive, they came out with that three O-line weird formation, ran it once, and it worked on a screen to Pollard. And then they tried to run it again and didn't work. And I don't know why they weren't just running the ball down the Chargers' throat at that point. So I think a couple of drives got stunted by weird play calling, uh, but it should have been more than that. Um, so Cowboys marched down the field on that first drive. Um, they had a fourth and one conversion, uh, where Kaiser was called for a pass interference. Seemed like a fair call to me. Um, 
third and one Pollard gets the first down pretty easily. Um, there's that long completion to Blake Jarwin over the middle. Um, third and five completion to Amari Cooper. And then, uh, Chargers were fooled badly on a little end around to Tony Pollard and uh, he scores a touchdown and beat Nasir Adderley to the corner of the end zone. So quick 7-0 lead for the Cowboys. Chargers come out and, um, you know, Eckler hits a big hole to the left side at a 12 personnel. Rashawn Slater had a key block there to, to spur him. Um, Storm Norton and Ode Bushi got beat on a stunt there. Herbert makes up for it, escapes finds Keenan Allen for a first down and then they go play action. They're in Cowboys territory. They go play action. Keenan runs a little spear out, a little, you know, heading towards the, the left sideline. Uh, you know, Justin Herbert is always going to look for 13. And uh, it just so happened that Trayvon Diggs, their best cornerback, their best defensive back was in coverage on Keenan on that play. You can question the decision of going after Diggs at that point in the game. You know, there's a lot of weak points in that Cowboys secondary. Uh, but Justin is always going to look for Keenan Allen. He looked for him on that play. Brandon Stilley said that he probably should have flattened the route out a little bit more. He got a little vertical, created an angle for Trevon Diggs, could have taken it a sharper angle to the sideline. Uh, but Justin tried to fire it in there, and Tra Trevon Diggs made a, made a fantastic play for the interception. So Cowboys take over from their own 20. And it looked like a miscommunication between Dak and uh, Amari Cooper, uh, but Asante Samuel Jr. came up with a big interception there. Ball went right to him. Uh, so Chargers take back over, um, hit Eckler first on a swing screen for a big gain, a play action boot. Mike Williams gets involved. Um, and then there's a weird third and five play where, you know, Eckler motioned out wide right, but it looked like the Cowboys were showing a zero blitz and Herbert saw it coming and tried to check to a screen. But I don't know if there was another check from the Dallas defense or they were just disguising that. Uh, but the screen didn't work because Dallas dropped out of that zero look, zero blitz look, all out blitz look into a, a soft zone. And um, they corralled the screen uh, and stopped that short. Uh, so Vizcaino, 46 yard field goal. That makes a 7 3. Uh, Cowboys take back over. And, and I mean, the run defense was brutal on this drive. The first play, Tony Pollard gets a big gain. Uh, Tony Pollard again for six yards. Uh, Second and four, Dak hits Tony Pollard on a swing pass. Michael Davis, who I thought had a pretty rough game, um, especially as a run defender. Uh, he loses contain there. Pollard gets the edge. Then they hand it off to C.D. Lamb. On second down, Lamb gets a pass from Dak Prescott. He beats Sade Samuel Jr. on a comeback. Um, C.D. Lamb found room again on first down. Uh, broke a Kenneth Murray tackle. I didn't think t Murray tackled very well today. Um, and then first and goal from the five, I mean, they just ran right behind Zach Martin and he just moved people. I mean, they had nobody up front that could match up with Zach Martin. He was just dominating people and Zeke just coasted right in the end zone. It's 14, three before the end of the first quarter. Um, chargers did respond early in the second quarter with a nice touchdown drive. Um, hit Keenan Allen out of the backfield. Um, on a little short cross or off play action. That's when he got called for the taunting, um, which really negated the play. Um, first down, uh, they had a max protection play action. Uh, he was looking for Jared Cook on the left sideline. It was tipped and picked, um, but they called pass interference on the play, so that pick was negated. Um, they came out with a, a big package on first down with Trey Pipkins and Donald Parham both in the game. Um, handoff to Eckler. Uh, and he was swallowed up there. Um, ended up facing a third and 11 uh, after 92 came free off the, the right side. I don't know who messed up on that play, but Storm Norton, uh, you know, it was his side. He took an interior rusher. 92 came free. Uh, Herbert took a big shot there. He tried to throw hot to Eckler. They ended up losing two. Uh, but Herbert had a nice throw on third and 11 there. Justin Jackson had an amazing blitz pickup on that third and 11. and. Um, he was able to hit a cook for a first down. Um, they got behind the sticks again with, because of a holding on storm Norton. Um, first and 20, uh, Herbert hits Guyton second and 11, um, was a handoff to Eckler. 
97 had a stuff there. So they had a third and eight. Winslow gets called for a false start. Uh, they had a third and 15. And um, that was when Micah Parsons got called for that offside against Nor Storm Norton. He beat him there. Uh, but Herbert did an outstanding job of escaping the pressure and, and finding um, Mike Williams for a decent chunk there for a first down. And then they go right to Mike Williams uh, on that little screen to the left. Williams breaks a tackle, dives for the touchdown. Uh, Eckler scores a two-point conversion. And it's 14 to nine. Um, moving forward, Cowboys take over uh, and they have more success on the ground. Um, and they end up turning the, turn it over on downs. Asante Samuel had a really nice play on Amari Cooper. Looked like there was lots of contact on that play, no flag. Um, so they end up forcing a turnover on downs. Chargers get the ball and, you know, have a chance to, to take the lead there. Um, Ty Long comes on to punt and they do this weird formational thing. And um, Ty Long gets absolutely crushed. They run all out pressure on the punt block and he gets crushed, roughing the punter. They take over again, uh, drive a little bit further. Um, and then, you know, Storm Norton continued to struggle on the right side there. Vizcaino misses the field goal. Um, and then the Cowboys almost score on that crazy touchdown at the end of the um, first half. So it is 14-11, right? I said 14-9. It should be 14-11 heading into the second half. Um, and then, so the Chargers take over to start the, 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 the second half. Um, they drive down, and this is where it got kind of weird, right? They run, uh, you know, they face the fourth and one. Herbert sneaks it, picks up the first down. Um, on that first down, they run a play-action boot to the right side. Justin Herbert throws an absolute missile over the middle of the field. It was like a 45-yard throw on a line, like with no arc. He hits Mike Williams, and that's when Ode Ibushi gets called for a legal man downfield. And this is the first penalty, so we can get into it now. So basically what happens is Herbert runs that PA boot to the right. He rolls out. Abushi is blocking up front. He moves two yards in front of the line of scrimmage to block a Cowboys defense event just to get a shot on him. As Abushi goes to block the defensive end, he kind of misses him. And like his momentum from the block carries him forward. And this is as Herbert is releasing the ball. So according to the rule book, okay, here's what it says. An ineligible offensive player is illegally downfield if after losing contact with an opponent more than one yard beyond the line of scrimmage, he continues to move toward his opponent's goal line. You look at the replay. Technically, by the book, Abushi is loses contact with an opponent and is moving forward toward the opponent's end zone, toward the opponent's goal line. So by the book, technically, it is a correct call. Now, my question is, how consistently is that getting called on a snap-to-snap -snap basis around the league? That's the question that you have to answer. I don't have enough data to tell you that it is called consistently or it isn't called consistently. I can tell you that based on experience, doesn't seem like that play is probably called that way, snap to snap to snap, or else you'd have a lot more illegal men downfield penalties. So by the book, correct. So it's hard to sit here and say, okay, this was a, a blown call because it wasn't. By the book, according to the rule book, it was a correct call. But It was a technicality, and I don't know if that call is being called that way snap to snap. So that's where I'm at with that. Herbert makes up for it. They get behind the sticks because of that penalty, and they face a third and 15. That's when Herbert finds Keenan Allen down the right sideline for a 42-yard gain. And that was when the Chargers brought in Jared Cook to help Storm Norton. They had a six-man protection there. And that gives Herbert enough time 
to find Keenan Allen. It gives Keenan Allen enough time to run the route. That's the big play on the drive. They weirdly run a second and 12 zone read where Herbert tried to keep up the middle. He got stuffed. Um, and then, you know, third and 11 from the 14, Storm Norton gets beat again. I mean, I, I am really eager to see what the pressure numbers look like for Storm Norton because I could see it being like, you know, five, six, seven pressures on the day just from what I saw and what I have in my notes. But Vizcaino makes a field goal. Chargers tie it up at 14. Cowboys take over. Um, and this is when the running game, the run defense started to improve slightly. Um, but just looking here, Ezekiel Elliott to the left side behind, and Zach Martin had a great block on Linval Joseph to open up that hole. That's a six yard gain. 21, Ezekiel Elliott again on the following first down. Huge hole to the left side, big, big game. Two first downs later, Ezekiel Elliott cuts back for four. And then on second and six, for the second time in three plays, they throw that three-man line formation out there again. He try, Dak tries to dump it off to C.D. Lamb, and Derwin's there on the right side. To tackle for a loss. They face a third and ten. Finally, they can dial up some pressure, and Joey Bosa gets home off the edge, and Derwin and Jerry Turley clean it up for a sack. And Cowboys punt. Now, what happens here? is K.J. Hill fields a punt at the two-yard line, which you just can't do. You have to let that ball drop. 99 times out of 100, that ball bounces in the end zone. You get the ball to 20. He picks it up, you know, fields the punt, and the Chargers start that drive from the nine. Chargers continue to move the ball really well here. Eckler for nine to start it. Checks down to Eckler on second down for a first down. A play-action boot finds Steven Anderson for a seven-yard gain. They get a holding call and a back shoulder seam ball to Eckler. First down. Justin Jackson for five yards. Uh, Herbert's under pressure on second and six. He gets it away to 13, and that's where the, uh, Keenan like dropped it and almost got picked off. Third and six, he hits Josh Palmer. He hits Mike Williams on an out route from the far hash, which was a great throw. And then comes second and two. From inside Cowboys territory, they run a little leak route with Donald Parham from the right. He's in line on the right side. He runs a little leak route down the left side wide. Herbert does a little sprint right, throws back across the formation. Parham's wide open. Touchdown. Chargers take the lead until it wasn't. Flag comes out, and this was a legitimate flag. They kept Jared Cook. He was lined up to the right of Parham. Okay, Parham goes out on his route. Cook's into block. Leighton Van Der Esch blitzes, beats Jared Cook, and Jared Cook blatantly holds Leighton Van Der Esch. That was a completely legitimate call. Touchdown gets called back. And to their credit, the Chargers come back. They, they split Eckler out in the slot. He runs a little double move. Fantastic route out of the slot. Makes a ridiculous one-handed catch there off the double move. Um, that sets the Chargers up at the 13. and. Um, Guyton on a short route. Uh, they tried to go to Mike on a little fade, had to throw that one away. Then there's third and six, and Allen is running an in route. Herbert reads it, tries to fire one in there to Allen. He falls over, goes right to DeMonte KZ, the safety interception in the red zone. Herbert's third red zone turnover of the season, absolutely not his fault in any way, shape, or form. It's just football. You know, sometimes your guys are going to lose, your, lose their footing. It came in a really crucial moment of the game, but it's hard to really pin that on any guy. You know, sometimes shit happens. That's just the reality of it. Cowboys take over at the 20 after a touchback, um, and then they just run it. Pollard for two. Pollard again. Michael Davis missed the tackle on the outside. Bounces that one outside for a long game. Hit C.D. Lamb for a screen. Dalton Schultz beats Nasir Adderley on third and seven. They get down inside the red zone. Nasir Adderley drops that interception in the end zone. It was a good play to break it up on coverage on Blake Jarwin. Then Kyler Fackrell comes off the edge and beats Tyron Smith for a sack fumble. Hell of a play. Defensive play of the day. Kyler Fackrell with beautiful hand usage. Just a little deke. 
on Tyron Smith to beat him off the edge, gets to Dak, forces the fumble. Tr- Cowboys recover. They kick the field goal to go up 17-14. Chargers respond with a really nice field goal drive. And this is where shit gets a little crazy, right? So let's go through this drive. Eckler, run for three. They ran a really nice design on an end around the guy and he picks up the first down. They kept Steven Anderson to chip for Storm Norton. Then he goes out for a route. He picks up two. Herbert finally gets some time on second and eight. He hits Mike Williams over the middle. They do a boot to the right. Looks like Herbert's going to be able to scramble. Uh, but the Cowboys defender on that play. does a nice job of tracking Herbert down. So they're facing second and seven. Pitch to Justin Jackson. Picks up the first. They go to Justin Jackson again. He gets four yards. Second and six. Play action. Protection holds up. They kept Donald Parman for protection. Herbert hits Keenan Allen on a deep cross. A money throw. That sets the Chargers up. First and goal from the two-yard line. The Chargers break the huddle. And they go to the line of scrimmage. They're in a spread formation. They got five offensive linemen. Larry Roundtree is in shotgun. Larry Roundtree is split left, split left of Justin Herbert. Okay. They've got Guyton and Mike Williams to the right. Williams on the outside, Guyton on the inside. They've got Cook and Allen to the left. Allen in the slot, Cook out wide. Right as Herbert gets to the line of scrimmage, Cook goes in motion immediately. There is no set. They get up there, Cook goes in motion to the inside, inside of Allen. As Cook is motioning inside, Mike Williams moves. He resets his feet. He adjusts his stance as Cook is moving, okay? Herbert takes the snap right when Cook gets to the inside. He never really stops moving. Allen and Cook run a little rub route. Cook gets open in the flat. Herbert hits him for the touchdown. Okay, Chargers take the lead, touchdown. Wait, wait, wait. No, flag on the field. Illegal shift is the call. Okay? Now, here's the situation. The rule book states let me find the exact quote here. Okay. The rule book states all offensive players are required to come to a complete stop. And be in a set position simultaneously for at least one full second prior to the snap. Failure to do so is an illegal shift. So let's go back to what I said before. They get to the line. And right when they get to the line, Cook goes in motion. The full second has not happened at that point of them being completely set. Because Mike Williams moves. After Mike Williams moves, they need to get set for a full second before the snap. If they do not do that, as a full 11-man unit before the snap, it is an illegal shift. That's the rule. So here you're talking about jet sweeps. Motion at the snap is totally fine. But if you go watch a jet sweep or a a motion at the snap or something like that, the team gets to the line of scrimmage. And sets for a second. And then the player goes in motion. The Chargers did not do that. And that is the penalty. So here's what Tony Corrente said. We got him in a pool report. Okay, so I'll read you the quote. This is a direct quote from Tony Corrente, the head official. We had, first of all, the team coming to the line of scrimmage to get set. And as the wide receiver on the offensive left side, that's Cook, began in motion, the offensive receiver on the right side, that's Williams, was still moving around. He was not in a set position. All 11 players have to be set simultaneously at least for a second before they can go into a shift or they can go into a motion. Well, what happened here was this player went into motion without his whole team being fully set at that point. So you had two receivers never reset to allow the formation to become legal. If Mike Williams doesn't move, it's fine. Williams moving, though, means that they did not get set initially 
for that full second prior to the snap. So that gets called back. It's first and goal from the seven. Mike Williams runs a little fade corner, tight coverage. Borderline doesn't get called. Second and goal from the seven. Play action, nothing open. Justin Herbert's holding, he's holding, he's swarmed. He runs backwards to avoid the pressure. And it looks like he gets the pass away. Falling backwards to Keenan Allen. Now, it looked like the ball got to the line of scrimmage. He was outside the tackle box. So the only thing that he has to do is just get the ball to the line of scrimmage. It doesn't need to be anybody in the area. But the referees rule that Herbert's forward progress had been stopped. That's the ruling. If they, It's a very subjective rule. If they rule that, they rule that. That sets them up with third and goal from the 25. They throw a quick slant to Eckler just to get into a more manageable field goal range. And Tristan Vescaino scores, uh, makes a field goal from 29 yards. 354 left in the fourth quarter. And then we all know what happened next. Dak leads the Chargers down the field. It was not a great drive. I mean, you want to get closer than 56 yards, but Greg Zorline has a big game, big leg. He hits from 56 yards. Chargers lose 2017. So there you have it. There's the breakdown. Chargers commit 13 penalties. 12 of them are called for 99 yards. You can argue, you know, two of them were controversial, correct by the book. The other 10 were legitimate penalties. You had 10 offensive penalties. It's going to be really hard to win games if you commit 10 penalties on one side of the ball. Really, really hard. So what does it come down to? Too many penalties. Horrible, horrible run defense. I mean, the defensive line got bullied today. And then untimely, unlucky turnovers, right? That red zone turnover looms large. And, you know, there's nothing you can really do about it. You can't coach your player not to slip on the grass. But you add all those things together and you get a loss. And at the end of the day, They overcame all of that to have a chance to win it in the fourth quarter. Which I think speaks to the talent that they have and the coaching staff that they have. But in the end, it wasn't enough. And, you know, you guys are well aware of how these games go. You know, you're in close games. Sometimes you lose them. All right. Let's get some questions in. What do you guys got? Pedro asked, so I think Braden Fajoko could help out in the run defense. I mean, the reality is they need Justin Jones. You know, I think, I think Forrest Merrill, maybe. But you're talking about undrafted free agents, young players that are still developing. Like, they don't have the depth. I mean, how long have we been talking about this? I told you guys. I mean, if you guys read me at the, at the Athletic, if you've been, you know, watching these streams over the last six months or however long we've been doing them, like, I talk about the same shit. Offensive line depth is a concern. Defensive line depth is a concern. Those are my two biggest concerns entering, entering the season. What happened? You don't have the offensive line depth. Brian Belaga goes down which was inevitable. And you have Storm Norton in there getting worked by a converted linebacker. That's a big reason why they struggled to score points offensively is the pressure that was on Justin Herbert. And I think Herbert did a fantastic job of, of avoiding pressure and making plays using his pocket feel as athleticism, off platform, throws, all of those things to help mitigate some of the pressure. But, you know, Storm Norton is an inconsistent player, plain and simple. They don't have the depth there. Defensive line, they don't have the depth. They didn't do a whole lot to bolster it this offseason. They signed Christian Covington. He's a fine player. Didn't play that well today. So you lose Justin Jones, and all of a sudden you're in trouble. And I wrote this in July. Go look at my Twitter. I tweeted it out. Did a mailbag. What are your biggest concerns? Well, defensive line. Justin Jones is an injury-plagued player. 
he goes down with an injury, you're going to have a tough time stopping the run because one man and Linval Joseph can't do it. And what do we see today? No Justin Jones. Linval Joseph doesn't have a great game against a really good line led by Zach Martin. And Jerry Tillery is, is not a good player. He got bullied today, straight up, plain and simple. So you don't have the depth in the interior. You don't have the depth in the trenches. Start losing players and you get this. This wasn't a secret. You know, no one should be scratching their head here. You look at this roster, you really analyze this roster heading into the season. You could see it. I certainly could. And I know you guys heard me talk about it. So that's what it is. All right. Rant over. More questions. James Hecht says, I would trade Herbert for Jameis. Should we put him in timeout? I think we should put him in timeout. James is in timeout for that comment. All right, more questions, more questions. Bring them in. Good question from Mark. He says, how big was the impact of not having Chris Harris Jr.? It was immense. And I mean, credit to the Chargers, right? Passing defense-wise for, for putting it together. Um, and, you know, really for the most part, um, putting a roof over the coverage. I mean, you can really take away – I need to ask Brandon Staley about that end of half play because it was like one of the weirdest plays I've ever seen in my life. I don't know what happened. Keemon Hall missed the tackle. Kenneth Murray missed the tackle, and then all of a sudden they almost won. But you take that play out of it, okay? Their longest offensive player of the day was a 28-yard run by Tony Pollard. Their second longest play of the game was a 23-yard run by Tony Pollard. Um, and then the, the next longest pass was that 20-yarder to, to Blake Jarwin on the opening series. I'm counting here. They had one, two, three other passes over 13 yards. So the pass defense showed up, you know, the Brandon Staley with his scheme is going to put a roof over the coverage and, um, you know, prevent explosive plays. He's going to do that regardless of his personnel is, but I will say this, not having Chris Harris jr. Forced Derwin James to play in the slot pretty much the whole game. He was in, he was at safety and base defense, but they were playing nickel, you know, 70 plus percent of the time. And he was in the slot, all of those plays. He's great in there. But I think what makes what would make the defense elite and what made them really good against Washington was that you could move Derwin around. You could play him at safety. In nickel, you could play him at safety. And then you could go to a big nickel package where he was in star and you could use James in the slot sparingly as a little bit of, an, of a wrinkle in the defense, you know, a little seasoning on top, right? A little, a little disguise, a little mix up, a little change up. Today he was in there all the time. And I'm going to ask Staley about this tomorrow. And I didn't get a chance because there are a lot of people at the press conference and we don't really get, you know, get into like the, you know, meat of the stuff that I like to get into. But my thought from watching it is, okay, if you have Chris Harris, you go to nickel, you put him in the slot. You've got Michael Davis and Asante Samuel Jr. on the outside. And you have Derwin at safety, at strong safety. And so let's say, you know, it's clear after that first drive or the first two drives, right, that your run defense isn't getting it done. You can bring Derwin down, right? Call some some um, some defensive plays, you know, some do some things schematically where Derwin James is in the box and around the ball. And maybe that helps your run defense. But because you don't have Chris Harris Jr., Derwin has to play that star position in the slot. And so you can't bring him into the box and try and maybe, you know, have him help your run defense. And I saw a lot of that because when you're playing in the slot, you're on one side or other, the other side of the formation. And there were a lot of times, especially on some of those runs off, off the end, where they were just running away from Derwin and just taking him out of the play. And their corners and linebackers weren't tackling well enough to set the edge there. 
And so I think there was a domino effect of not having Chris Harris because Derwin James had to be in the slot. I think that significantly impacted the run defense because you couldn't put Derwin in the middle of the field in nickel packages. Now, that's just me, you know, in my opinion. And I'd lo- I'm really eager to ask Staley about it tomorrow just to get his thoughts on it because I could be wrong. But to me, having having that ability to put Derwin in the box in the middle of the field and have him help out and run defense, I think that c- could have made a difference today. And so that's what you're talking about with the loss of Chris Harris. All right. Good question here from G. He says, how did Bosa get locked up all day by the Cowboys' backup tackle? So I asked Staley about this after the game, and he brought up a good point. When you're running the ball as efficiently as the Cowboys were running the ball, you're facing a lot of third and manageables. I mean, look through this first drive. Third and three, third and two, third and one, third and five. Okay, let's keep going. Next drive, they didn't even face a third down when Ezekiel Elliott scored the five-yard touchdown. Next drive, when they turned it over on downs, they didn't face a third down until one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plays into the drive. Moving into the second half. The one time Joey does get home on a blitz when they bring Derwin on a blitz. The Cowboys had one, two, three, four, five, six first or second downs before they faced a third down. We can keep going. Next drive. They go first and second down. First and second down. They have one third and seven in there. Where they go into dime and that's when Nas got beat by Dalton Schultz, right? They convert that. Three plays later, they're on third and nine. And what happens? Kyler Fackrell wins off the edge against Tyron Smith, sack fumble. So the point being, when you're running the ball that efficiently and that effectively, you're not facing a lot of third downs to begin with. And when you do get to third down, they're very manageable. And so how do pass rushers make their money, right? It's third and seven, third and eight, third and nine, third and 10, 11, 12, right? Those plays where the defensive end or edge rusher knows that the other team has to pass. And that means you can pin your ears back and get after the quarterback. You can bring blitzes. You can do all of these different things because you know the other team has to pass. You're facing a third and eight from your own 38, right? You're not running a draw. You're passing. And that gives the edge rusher an advantage. It gives the defense an advantage because you know what's coming and you can get after the quarterback. That didn't happen today. And so that's how Staley explained it. And it made a lot of sense to me right? There just weren't that many situations where Joey Bosa could really pin his ears back and get after the quarterback. Now, I'm sure if you talk to him, we didn't get to talk to him after the game. We talked to him tomorrow. I'm sure he would tell you that he could have played better, but frankly, because of how well they were running the football and Joey was a part of that run defense, there just weren't that many opportunities to get after the quarterback. And that matters. Situations matter when you talk about how a pass rusher played. All right, more questions. I'm feeling it. Special teams, um, yeah, not a great day for special teams. Um, you know, I talked about the KJ Hill punt, um, and then the missed field goal, obviously, loom large there. What else we got? Mm-mm. Isaac asks, why do you think they left Norton on an island? So sometimes you have to, like, 
it's not, you know, you cannot go max protect on every play. Um, sometimes he's going to have to block. Like, that's your job as a tackle. Now, I got to go back and watch the film, and I'll have more on this once I get to actually watch the tape to see actually how much they max protected, how much they had six and seven man protections is what I'm saying. When they kept the tight end in, when they chipped, they were helping him. Like, and that big play to Keenan Allen, they helped Storm Norton, but, you know, I think there were some plays where they just felt like they had to get guys out in, in routes and, and Norton got beat on those plays. So I'll have more on that when I get to watch the tape. Is Michael Davis a true number one corner? No, and I've never said he was a true number one corner. Anyone who's read me, anyone who's watched these streams, I've told you he's a really good number two. That's what he's always been to me. Um, he's too inconsistent to be a true number one corner. And that's the reality. That's where he's at right now. He hasn't had a very good start to the season. He's been a liability in run defense. Uh, Asante Samuel Jr. has played better than Michael Davis so far this season. Right. Sean says it was clear on the plays. They didn't help him. Right. So, you know, I have to go back and watch the tape on that stuff because I'm I'm looking at it. The plays where they didn't help him, he was getting beat. And so to me, it was like, why wouldn't you help him more often? Um, but I need to go back and watch the tape to give you guys a clear answer on sort of how much they were helping him. And, and you know, if there was really a decision there, a conscious decision to leave him on an island pretty often. I tweeted that because I saw him kept getting beat in one-on-one -on -one situations. And I was like, what's going on here? Um, but I'd rather, you know, watch the tape and come back to you guys with some um, you know, detailed analysis of that. But when he was left on an island, he got beat and it happened a lot. I mean, he's, he's going to end up with five, six, seven pressures against them. And that's a really rough game for a tackle. And, and all those pressures came on times when he was on an island. So to me, it felt like, okay, you know, I think part of it is he played well against Washington. They were expecting him to be able to hold his own here and it didn't happen. You know, I think they were expecting more from him. They were expecting him to ascend as a player, and he didn't do that. And you got to sort of put stuff on a player's plate and be like, hey, can you handle it? And today I think Storm showed that he can't really handle that. And I could have told you that before, you know, the game started. You know, to me, the game plan has to be help him, help him, help him, and make sure that he doesn't wreck the game. Um, because today he, uh, you know, he wrecked. Thomas says 11 pressures. That can't be right. The PFF come out with their pressure numbers? 11 would be just insane. Let's see. Now it looks like it's still all pending. All right. 11 would be freaking crazy. Who Who's we at? Where are you guys seeing 11? 11 would be crazy. I mean, I wouldn't be that surprised, to be honest. He was in, he was in rough shape, honestly. Where are you guys seeing 11? I mean, it was a lot. Like, it was ugly. But 11 is just like, that has to be some sort of record. And is Joe Lombardi's scheme not allowed for the deep shots we saw so much of last year? I mean, he hit Keenan Allen for 42 yards. What more do you guys want? He also hit Mike Williams on the same drive for 31 yards, and that got called back because of that, whatever you want to call it, illegal man downfield penalty, you know? Technical. We can go technical, ticky-tacky. I mean, Tony Romo, I rewatched the game. Tony Romo said on the broadcast he thought it was ticky-tacky, so. I mean, they're pushing the ball downfield. They had, they had like seven or eight completions of 17 or more yards. If you, if you, if you go into a game and be like, I'm not going to be happy with the offensive scheme unless we hit a 65-yard touchdown, then that's unrealistic. You're not going to hit 70-yard bombs every, every, every week. I think that was an aberration last year. Um, and that was also like Anthony Lynn's game plan, you know? establish the run and then take your shots and they dot them up. They schemed them up well, but you know, would you rather have, you know, six or seven, 17 plus yard completions or one 65 yard touchdown? I don't know.
I just don't – who is this – there's a guy named Dallas Young who's in here just like – we're going to put him in timeout because, like, why would you be a Cowboys fan and then, like, come into this stream? Now, Cowboys fans are welcome, but I'm just trying to rile people up. Like, you, you obviously haven't been a part of the stream because we're all about the positive vibes. Come in and bring the positive vibes. Don't talk shit. Don't do that. Do you feel that after the Norton performance, it's better to move Matt Filer over to tackle and uh, add a new guard? It would be Brendan Hymas. You know, I just don't, right? I wrote about this this week. I just don't know. PFF News says 10 or 11 pressures from the right tackle. Good Lord. So I just don't see them making that move because they want Slater to continue playing at a high level. And he right now has some really nice synergy with Matt Filer. And so you move Matt Filer to right tackle and you bring in Brendan Hymas, a rookie, and you play on the left guard. And all of a sudden you've got two rookies next to each other. And you worry about, okay, what does that do to Slater? His development and his performance is really important, not just for this season, but for the future and for the Super Bowl window. And so, you know, it gets, it gets difficult. You know, they kind of have all their eggs in this Norton basket right now. Like they need him to play well. And that's part of the issue is they just don't have the depth. Like these are problems that you have to solve by drafting and developing offensive linemen over years, right? And failing to do so puts you in a position where you do not have the depth to overcome injuries. And that's where they're at. All right. It's getting late. Done with my June shine. Any other quick questions that you want me to get to? Um, while I have you guys in here, if you don't subscribe to The Athletic, click the link below. All my takeaways from the game, even more detailed than I went in this stream. So go check that out. Uh, this week we'll have uh, my final thoughts on the game, which I'll you know kind of tie everything together after Staley's pressers tomorrow. That'll either run late tomorrow or Tuesday morning. I'm going to do a breakdown of the star and money positions and how all the positions work out in Staley's scheme because you guys asked for that. Um, I'll do a film breakdown this week, probably focusing on Jerry Tillery because it's about time we did that. Um, and then, as always, I'll have the mailbag on Friday to get everyone ready for the Chiefs game. So if you don't subscribe, it's Chargers content all the time. So click that link below, read my thoughts on the game, and you'll get all that stuff this week as well. Anything else? Anybody got anything else? I'm, like, falling asleep here. Anything else? Any final questions? Going once. Going twice. Going three times. So, all right, folks. Everyone have a great rest of your night. Appreciate everyone joining the stream. Uh, make sure you subscribe to The Athletic. Read all my stuff. Follow me on Twitter at Daniel R. Popper. Have a good night. Peace out, everybody. <laughs>